In the late 1800s, a rising dinosaur star was heralded in America's newspapers. This dynamic, fearsome carnivore, first described by Edward Drinker Cope in 1866, shattered the image of the slow, stupid, lumbering behemoth for the first time. Described routinely in the press as the deadliest, most formidable predator to ever walk the earth, Cope named this nearly two-ton monster Laylaps after the unerring hunting dog of Greek mythology. Its fearsome visage should have cemented this dinosaur as one of the great terrors of the human imagination and made it a future star of cinema and a favored beast inhabiting the world's bookshelves and toy boxes. But this was not to be. Instead, Laylaps was destined to lose its status among the A-list prehistoric luminaries, all because of a tiny mite and two gigantic egos far more ferocious than this Cretaceous carnivore. Laylaps was only one of around 1,000 prehistoric vertebrate species described by Edward Drinker Cope, a self-taught Quaker scientist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. However, it was a remarkably singular fossil find in its time. In the early days of American paleontology, only terrestrial herbivores and sea creatures had been identified, leaving a gap in the food chain. For example, Hadrosaurus, a massive herbivore, had been discovered in the Woodbury Formation in New Jersey. By 1860, enough bones emerged to constitute a full skeletal restoration, convincing the nation's leading paleontologist, Joseph Leidy, that the creature was most likely bipedal when everyone else believed dinosaurs were squatting quadrupeds. But where was the Cretaceous lion to stalk this Mesozoic antelope? In England, the discovery of a large predator, Megalosaurus, accompanied the identification of a comparable herbivore, Iguanodon. And since ecosystems rarely exist without both predator and prey, Cope and others understood that prehistoric hunters must await discovery somewhere in the American soil. Initially, only teeth fragments emerged, but that changed in 1866 when Cope assembled enough bones from a New Jersey dig to identify America's first Tyrannosaurid. The evocative creature deserved an evocative name, which Cope provided. Unlike many dinosaur names that awkwardly slam ancient Greek roots together, Laylaps was poetic. Its literal translation means storm winds, and Laylaps had a real potential to roll off the tongue. In other words, to become as iconic as T-Rex. Moreover, like its name, this creature was something unique. Laylaps was clearly bipedal, but its strange orientation on the pelvis posed some questions regarding locomotion, and in his description, Cope pondered whether it moved like an ostrich or a kangaroo. Cope's writings quite clearly leaned towards the ostrich theory, but the idea of a giant predatory kangaroo took hold in the press. What followed was a pattern of exaggeration and speculation, inflating the animal in the public imagination. Cope estimated that an adult laylapse could be 23 to 25 feet long, but news articles portrayed a 40-foot-long hunter from snout to tail. Similarly, Cope noted that the creature's physiology suggested an ambush predator with great leaping ability, a radical idea in its time. But for decades, newspapers repeated the unsupported claim that laylapse could launch itself up to 70 feet. Not surprisingly, the discovery advanced Cope's prestige and spread his name through America, making him something of a rock star at the time. Cope apparently took no time to bask in the glory of finding America's first super predator. Instead, he was more concerned with the next discovery. In Cope's time, naming species was the primary goal in paleontology, and he seems to have been obsessed with this process. The record shows that Cope routinely dashed off descriptions of new species, sometimes within a few days of discovery without checking to see if his creatures were already known or if his names had been taken. In essence, his habit was to write a paper first and ask questions later, a practice that would soon get him into trouble. Naming mattered greatly to Cope's professional and personal rival, Professor O.C. Marsh of Yale University as well, but the two were cut from different cloth. 
Marsh had been formally educated and had a devotion to scientific empiricism. He was methodical and thorough. In contrast, Cope fit the mold of the gentleman scientist from the previous century, a class of leisurely naturalists whose work would be published with little systematic scrutiny and typically lauded uncritically. Consequently, Professor Marsh looked down on Cope, a man who had only taken one college course in his life. Still, this difference in style probably wouldn't have exploded into outright professional animosity had it not been for a foolish mistake. On September 18, 1868, Cope stood before the American Philosophical Society and described his newest wonder, an impressive sea creature he called Elasmosaurus platyurus. Unfortunately, in his rush to get the find published, he mistook the neck for the tail and envisioned the head on the wrong end of the animal. It seems almost impossible that Cope would make such a mistake, especially since similar plesiosaurs had been known for a century in Europe. But, as Jane P. Davidson argues in her article, Boneheaded Mistakes, Cope seems to have made the error when he first got the fossil, and simply stuck to his original concept, either without consulting or listening to anyone else. It was much worse than a single error at a conference. In early 1870, Cope had a pamphlet published and distributed, complete with an erroneous skeletal reconstruction, which came under the scrutiny of O.C. Marsh. While variations on the story exist, Marsh ultimately proved Cope's interpretation wrong and subsequently used the blunder to make his chief competitor look incompetent in the eyes of other scientists, setting off several decades of bitter professional warfare. In the aftermath, Cope tried frantically to retract it and retrieve the copies that had already been released, but it was an impossible task, especially since the gloating Marsh refused to return his. Whether it was haste, foolishness, or arrogance, Cope's folly would haunt him the rest of his life and initiate a tit-for-tat competition with Marsh that left them both with victories, defeats, and public bruises. But how does this all relate to poor Laylaps? In 1877, Marsh discovered that the name Laylaps had been used in taxonomy to denote a lowly little mite well before Cope's dinosaur, and he leapt on it. The discovery meant that while Cope first described the creature, Marsh would ultimately choose its name. Enter Dryptosaurus, the tearing lizard, Marsh's usurpation of a Cope trademark. In true Cope fashion, however, he never accepted Marsh's new name and continued to write about Laylaps as though the impertinent mite never existed. In fact, he even introduced a Canadian subspecies, Laylaps and Cope, in 1892. And all the while, Marsh was promoting the same animal as Dryptosaurus. Beyond the embarrassment of the public pettiness, which incidentally erupted in the New York Herald near the end of both men's lives, the situation created unnecessary confusion for decades and almost certainly contributed to Laylaps's near invisibility today. In the end, the name Dryptosaurus would be victorious, in no small part because Marsh outlived Cope for two years, but not before Laylaps created one final stir in the public imagination. In 1897, just a few months before Cope died alone and penniless after spending most of his fortune in competition with Marsh, a young, talented painter, Charles R. Knight, came to visit him in Philadelphia for insight on the lives of dinosaurs. In their conversations, amid Cope's macabre refuge of bones and relics, Cope revealed to Knight a prehistoric world filled with living, breathing, energetic animals, with active, agile hunters, and formidable prey. The conversations produced some of the most familiar images of dinosaurs in the world, including the leaping laylaps seen here. Eventually, other predators with less confusing histories, like Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex, captured the public imagination, leaving laylaps behind in the proverbial dust. However, Knight's painting was perhaps the first blow in overcoming the image of lethargic, dim-witted tail draggers. 